uh, my disclosures. This is the agenda for my talk. It's background first, a little bit, then the roadblocks and last the challenges we have. Let me start with the evidence. Uh, so what do we know? We know that uh, HIV incidence among MSM in Europe is going up, which means or would suggest that current preventive strategies are not working or at least not working enough. And we have another evidence is that we have a new a preventive tool, the PrEP, which works. We know that. We know because there are several studies, clinical trials, where we see the efficacy of the, of the PrEP. This is the, the main or most important trials implemented. And you can see that there are two trials where no efficacy was shown. This last two, the FEMPREP and the VOICE. These studies were implemented in Africa among African women. And no efficacy was observed, but this was because of lack of adherence, as you were seen after. So we know that PREP works. We know that uh, we have these studies implemented in uh, the States, in South America, Thailand, even Africa. But, uh, and know that adherence is crucial. Uh, we know also that even uh, with not 100% adherence, the protection can be quite high. So uh, we said that these clinical trials have been implemented in other parts, but what about Europe? Are we different from these, these other countries? And the answer is no, we are the same. We have two well-designed studies implemented in Europe, which one is the PROUD study in the UK, and another study, well, the PROUD study was conducted by Sheena McCoynmark, and the Hypergay study in France and Canada, but may, most of the participants were in, in France, conducted by Jean-Michel Molina. And what can we see in these studies? Well, the PROUD was designed to mimic the real world, which means that there was no placebo, there were two arms, one of the one group starting prep just uh, at the beginning of the study, and the other group was supposed to start prep 12 months later. But because of the results, as you can see in this slide, it was shown an efficacy of 86 percent, which is a really high efficacy, and. They knew that before the study finished, was in, on the, uh, one of the interim analysis, and that's why the monitoring board advised to offer PrEP to everybody because of ethical reasons. Knowing this degree of protection was not ethical and not offering PrEP to, to the people who was not receiving PrEP. Uh, the Hypergay study has another design uh, there was placebo in this, there was one arm of placebo, but uh, the difference, the main difference is that the regime was not daily regime, but on demand, which means that it was what it's called even driven, uh, driven uh, uh, strategy. And means that you, you, the participant had to take the, the pills, the Truvada, two pills between two hours and 24 hours before having sex, then one pill, 24 hours later, and another one 48 hours later. This regime could be appropriate for people who have sex occasionally. Uh, yes, I, I know it's hard to believe it, but there are people who don't have sex every day. <laughs> and, and for this, people could be a good, a good design. And the results were exactly the same. The reduction was... Uh, 86% of reduction of HIV incidence among, this study was uh, uh, implemented among MSM and transgender women, like the, the PROUD study also, but uh, as I said, the same uh, degree of protection. Uh, well, you can say, well, but these are clinical trials, it's different from real life. Okay, let's go to real life, real world. We, as an example, I'm going to talk about this study, which was implemented in San Francisco, it's the Kaiser study, and among more than 650 MSM in San Francisco, and during a follow-up period, mean period of 32 months, 
they didn't see any, no new infections. So PrEP works also in real world, and there are other studies, as we'll see. Uh, based on this, the WHO released is the recommendations saying that PrEP should be offered to everybody at risk. This is a strong recommendation and with a highly quality evidence. But uh, do, do, do we follow these guidelines in Europe? Let's go to Europe, to our, our countries, and let's see what's happened in, in Europe. Well, start, I would like to start with France. Because right now, France is the, the only uh, country in Europe where PrEP is fully available. There are s currently 60 clinics in France providing PrEP, and which is more important. It's fully covered by the national health system. Uh, it's available since January this year. And another important point, it's provided through recommendation of temporary use, because through others we'll see it's not yet approved by the European Medicine Agency for PrEP indication. There is an organization, the eighth organization, which provides information about PrEP and also where you can get PrEP, where do you have a clinic to get PrEP in, in France. Uh, I like to, I want to congratulate Jean-Michel Molina and his team because I think that thanks to uh, his, his work and his study. Uh, PrEP is now available, fully available in France, and um, the French Minister of Health announced last November that PrEP would be available for everybody who, who, who need it in France. <laughs> yes. And what about UK? Well, in UK, the, as far as I know, the, the Truvada was provided in the protest study, but finished last, last month. And these are not good news, I think, as that is an announcement by the NIH last month, I think, saying that prevention is the remit of local health authorities, so they are not responsible for that. I don't I don't think this is the way of avoiding responsibilities, but this is my opinion. So right now, if you want PrEP in the UK, what can you do? You can go to a clinic like 56 Dean Street. This clinic depends on the Westminster Hospital. And there you get advice. You, you can be follow-up because it's important if you are on PrEP to do a follow-up. And they... They can tell you where you, you can buy the Truvada because, as I said before, it's not, it's not provided within the national health system. There are several, uh, you can buy Truvada or it's generic online, which is much cheaper. You, Truvada, it's more than 400 euros, whereas you can buy a generic uh, by 40 something euros per month. So they tell you how can you get the Pruvada and do the follow-up, as I said before. There is another, another, webs another website where you can buy also uh, Truvada online. Uh, it's based in the, States, in the States, and just to, I, I like to, to highlight that if you are based, you live in San Francisco, you can get the pill in two hours, which if you have some kind of sexual emergency, you just to, to wait two hours. <laughs> Uh, so, what about the rest of the countries? Well, as far as I know, there are two ongoing projects in Europe, in Amsterdam and in Antwerp. Uh, I know that in Italy it's, there is a plan a study in Bologna. As, as far as I know, today there was a meeting to authorize or to, to, to decide uh, about this project. I can tell you about Spain that uh, we have uh, submitted a project, a demonstration project to Gilead, and today we'll know the, the decision, final decision. The objective is to implement a demonstration project in a community center, like Besana Checkpoint, maybe some of you know it. It's a community center uh, for MSM, uh, where I collaborate with them. I work in a, in a hospital, but also I collaborate in this community center uh, doing STI uh, screenings and detection or HIV detection. So we think that the community center could be a good setting for providing PrEP because you have to bear in mind that uh, PrEP users or candidates or potential PrEP users are not patients. They, are, they don't go to the hospital, not even the health center. So they would, could be more 
uh, who feel more comfortable going to a community center or rather than a clinic. So in a few hours, I, I will know whether these projects have been accepted. And in this, in this case, probably we would start uh, providing prep, I think that in one, two months. Uh, so uh, knowing all this evidence, knowing that it's possible to provide PrEP in Europe, the next question is, what are we waiting for? This is a picture of uh, was taken last Saturday in Barcelona and during the AIDS memorial. And uh, is, is this the speech of the director of Besana Point, the community center, asking to health authorities to start PrEP now. Uh, well, the answer was not <laughs> very, I would say that was rather frustrating, but we'll see. Uh, the, now let's talk about roadblocks. Of course, there are roadblocks. The first, as I said, is that Truvada is not yet approved, the indication not yet approved for, for PrEP. It was submitted in January this year. We expect by June to have a, a decision made. I want to remember that it was approved by the FDA in July 2012, which means that we are four years behind our colleagues in, in the States. And also roadblocks can come from the beliefs and knowledge among health professionals. And I would like to show you a study uh, implemented in, in the States and uh, the clinicians there in New England they perceive a lot of barriers for the prep implementation, like time constraints, lack of uh, participant requests for prep, or clinicians not being aware of the guidelines, or not even aware of prep, or not being trained. Uh, in this study, I would like to highlight these two points. More than 40% of these clinicians, these doctors, who had not prescribed did the prep, they did not envision doing so in the future. So they refused to do that. And a quarter of them were unfamiliar with the CDC guidelines. This is more than two years after the, public, the publication. And most of them were concerned about side effects, drug resistance, or increased risk behavior. We talk about this. But within the community also we can detect roadblocks and I think the first one and the most important is lack of information. And as an example, a survey implemented in the States, in Rhode Island, among MSM, 70%, more than 70% had little or no information about PrEP. Other roadblocks in, within the community could be the stigma and lack of community acceptance of the PrEP. Uh, some studies show this. Uh, for instance, the, in this study, when they say that the adherence could be compromised whether the PrEP has to be concealed. And this, another, this other study among Peruvian participants of PrEP studies, they said that they were unlikely to disclose PrEP use to their families because of fear of rejection or being seen as promiscuous. And I'd like to mention a, a term, I don't know where you have heard about that, but it's the, the word, tru, uh, the term, Truvada Whore. Truvada Whore was coined by a journalist uh, some years ago, uh, labeling people, or PrEP users, as promiscuous and irresponsible. There were some people reacting and saying, yes, I'm a Truvada Whore, because I want to be protected. So what's wrong on that, about that? And other, cons and other roadblocks could be concerns and fears and misconceptions. The first one could be uh, the, just a moment, right, the toxicity, about the toxicity. But if we look at the evidence, we see that the, in the, all the studies, the uh, percentage or the proportion of adverse events is similar among, between the, in, in the Truvada group, and the, the intervention group, and the placebo group. Also, if we, uh, we, it's true that it's been observed uh, some decrease in renal function and the bone mineral density, but in most of the cases was reversible and 
uh, uh, not very not very important. Uh, regarding drug resistance, uh, I hope that my colleague from Canada will talk much more about this. But uh, overall, there is a low resistance risk uh, to tenofovir and FTC during the use of PrEP. But it's true that he, there is a higher risk when the people uh, are already infected when they start PrEP. We've seen several cases which was not detected, the infection was not detected, and they start the PrEP, and it's more likely to, to appear resistances. This risk could be minimized by performing a PCR test before starting PrEP, which uh, narrows the window period. We could detect an infection after seven, 10 days. We do that and checkpoint, we do a PCR online, we have the results in 90 minutes. So this could be implemented also to minimize. And we don't know how uh, implementing PrEP on large scale could affect overall resistances, it's true. Other concern could, it's about risk compensation. We hear a lot about risk compensation. Here, okay, we start giving PrEP, everybody will stop using condom and we'll see a million of STIs. Well, let's, let's look at the evidence we have and we, if we look at the studies, we see that there is no difference in condom use, number of sexu sexual partners and STI incidence. There was only uh, one study implemented in Kenya where it was observed an increase of sexual partners. It's true that if we look at the demonstration project, like the San Francisco project, in a subset of, of individuals, of PrEP users, uh, it, was, it was observed an increase of uh, STI incidence and a decrease in the condom use. But probably it's a subset. We don't know whether they already had decided to use uh, or to stop using condom or to not to use condom as, as, as often. Uh, this could be the risk or could be minimized so through our STI screen. We are able to detect uh, infections, STIs, early, and even a symptomatic infection, then we can contribute and we can uh, slow down the, the, the transmission. Uh, I can tell you that in a study implemented in Checkpoint, we detected 22% of chlamydia and gonococ um, uh, among MSM, and most of them are asymptomatic. A uh, last roadblock, which is important, of course, is the cost. But if we look at the cost effectivity analysis, we see that if we prioritize those at high risk, and uh, the most important, if the drug, uh, uh, the price of the drug goes down, then would be cost effective, clearly cost effective. Based on that, uh, on this analysis, the <coughs> WHO, say that uh, PrEP is it's expected to be cost effective where the incidence of HIV is higher than 3% per person years or even at lower, maybe at lower incidence. I can tell you also that in, in our cohort in Barcelona, the, the cohort of MSM we, we have, the incidence is higher than 3% per person year. So all of them would be candidates for that. Uh, challenges, well, First, to address the skepticism from clinicians, gay community, payers, general population, increase uh, PrEP awareness among health professionals and people at risk, adapt prevention messages to include PrEP. I think that we cannot keep on talking about prevention without talking about PrEP. And define also appropriate models for care, for, uh, for access to PrEP. As I said before, we think that community-based organization can be uh, an appropriate place, but of course also in STI clinics, hospital, etc. Of course, we have to monitor and evaluate PrEP implementation and maybe to find new formulas like long-acting drugs. There is a study with uh, cabotegravir, which allows to, uh, to give an injection every two months, maybe three months, with a good a high degree of protection, and of course, to reduce the cost of drugs for PrEP. We know that uh, Truvada probably is going to be generic by eight, 2018, and this could change, the, obviously, the, the, the cost-effectivity analysis. Mm -hmm. 
I would like to finish my presentation with some positive messages about PrEP, because giving PrEP is not just a matter of reducing HIV incidence, but also a matter of improving quality of sexual life, and in the end, quality of life. And my conclusion is, again, what are we waiting for? Uh, the debate about PrEP, it's over. Now it's time for action. Thank you very much.